the birth of Europe. Continents collide, mountain ranges are born. When Africa crunched into Europe, the Alps were formed. Then they were carved by ice ages into the shapes we see today. And it was only when the last ice sheets withdrew that history began. Geology came before history, and the resources from within the earth have moulded our society on it. Metals transformed farmers into warring chieftains. Soils that erupted from inside the planet became the source of the prosperity that fed the Mediterranean civilization of the Greeks. A civilization that was seen and conquered and absorbed by another one, that of the Romans, who then marched north, extending their world to take hold of new lands that had been born beneath tropical seas. In these clear waters, formed the limestones that shaped the destiny of the northern nations. Their harvests fed the prosperity of medieval Christendom. But with that fruitfulness, the population multiplied beyond the bounds the continent could feed. From catastrophe, Europe was to climb to greatness once again, with the aid of a still older geological harvest, coal. Sweated labor was overtaken by steam. As the wheels of industry turned faster, science and technology transformed society, and ever more resources from the rocks were used. This is a history not of kings and generals, but of a continent and how it shaped our lives, of how its natural gifts have been used and abused to create a way of human life that has spread around the world. For all our differences, we are creatures of our continent, and on that continent rides our present and our future. The story begins 60,000 years ago. Down from the north swept a great tide of ice. From the pole as far as Poland, it stretched in an unbroken mass for 10,000 kilometers. Lock 
trapped in this icy mass with so much water that lakes, rivers, seas and oceans dried. Mountains were engulfed and the landscape buried two kilometers deep. The ice reshaped the face of Europe. Where it stopped lay a bleak landscape, but one that nevertheless bore life. Evolution had thrown up many strategies for survival. Some animals were woolly, wearing thick coats to keep out the intense cold, while others lived under the snow. Sixty thousand years ago, there was another kind of animal that had evolved too. The first true European. Neanderthal man. Like the reindeer and woolly mammoth, the Neanderthals seem to have been built for the cold. But were they our ancestors? And where were they from? It all began in Africa. Six million years ago, the ancestors of the chimpanzees and the ancestors of humans began to go their separate ways. Two million years ago, Amongst the wealth of other wildlife, there were at least six distinctly different human types. None of them us, not yet. But amongst them, and of particular interest to our story, is one known as Homo. From the few fossil skulls, it's possible to reconstruct the face that gazed across that African landscape. The chance of any fragment of human or animal surviving from so long ago was minute. It needed to have been overlooked by a range of efficient scavengers, which, working together, can reduce the largest carcass to absolutely nothing. This fact of life has made far harder the job of building a clear picture of human origins in Africa and of human arrivals in Europe. But fragments did survive. In Italy, at Isernia, three quarters of a million years ago, unusual circumstances combined to preserve large bones at least. A great pile of elephant tusks, bones of bears and hippopotami. Buffalo skulls, the remains of warthogs and lions. But it's far easier to preserve those uniquely human remains, tools. Stone tools. In fact, these chipped stones, if they were made by man, are the only human remains here. The sharpened rocks might have been used to skin these creatures. Or maybe not. The question is, is the sharpness of the rocks accidental, or did someone create it? Stone tool making helps to distinguish Homo from the ancestral apes. But it's hard to tell with a piece of flint whether it's sharp naturally or artificially.
natural processes can produce a flake that looks exactly like a man-made tool. But half a million years ago, tools were being made, and here the chippings lie. Archaeologists are certain of these, and mark each scattered flake with its own flag. The scatters show that the tools were made where and when they were needed, in time for a specific job, often the butchery of prey. At this site, Box Grove in Sussex, there was plenty of game. The bones of bison, beavers, bears, wolf, rhinoceri and lemmings tell us that. The pattern of the flint scatters shows if the tool makers were sitting or standing, even if they were left or right-handed, half a million years ago. Occasionally, as the archaeologists uncover the flints, they find the fossilised bones of the animals that were actually butchered. The razor-sharp flakes they used gave to the small-toothed humans the cutting power of a lion or a wolf. And though at this time the range of tools was small, they were often beautifully made, particularly the carefully crafted hand axes. Archaeologists can sometimes reassemble the original nodule of flint that was struck to produce sharp flakes. This then allows them to work out the exact sequence of events as the toolmaker worked. This nodule was struck repeatedly to make a series of cutting flakes. But when the toolmaker got to this point, he or she realized the flint had a flaw which made it impossible to continue. In a fit of anger, he smashed the remaining nodule to pieces. Who was this all-too-human European? Remarkably, the fossil bones tell us it's the same kind of homo type that we last saw living in Africa. How on earth did he get 7,000 miles north into the heart of Europe? It seems that the ice was directly responsible. As it grew down from the pole, it locked up more and more of the world's water. As a result, Africa became increasingly arid. Very slowly, as slowly as the ice cap itself expanded, the grazing herds moved their range to the wetter north in search of new pastures. The predators, the big cats, the wolves, the hyenas, and some of the humans went too. So the homotype humans followed the prey out into the inhabitable margins between the dry south and the frozen north, coming at last for the first time to Europe. After this first big push out of Africa, humans found themselves in a continually changing world. Over the millennia, the ice kept coming and going. In the past million years, there have been no less than 17 of these glacial tides. In fact, we're still in a nice age. It's just that the tide's out. Eventually, whether we like it or not, the ice will return.
sometimes Europe has been even warmer than now. And even strictly tropical animals have migrated here. Fossilised hippo bones have been found in Germany, France and Hungary. And even under London's Trafalgar Square. But much more typical is bitter cold. Today's warmth is a rare extreme. For 900,000 of the past million years, Europe has been a frozen, unforgiving place. In which all life faced extreme cold as a crucial factor in the battle for survival. There's plenty of hot scientific debate about the reasons for this climatic fluctuation. But a widely accepted theory is that the Earth is wobbling like a top oscillating slightly on its axis every 100,000 years or so. At certain times, this cools the poles just to the point where eventually the winter ice lasts through the summer. And that's all it takes. From then it starts to build up. It seems it was the ebb and flow of the ice that was the driving force behind man's evolution. In response to the harsh conditions, the first people in Europe, the homo type, began to change, to evolve. To conserve heat, their bodies became more massive. Sinuses in the brow enlarged to warm the freezing air, which would otherwise sear their lungs. The teeth changed, and the mouth and jaw grew forward, becoming a vice to grip meat whilst it was butchered. And eventually, all these changes combined to produce the Neanderthals, biologically adapted to their Ice Age world. In archaeological remains, amongst these dramatic cliffs at La Cotte de saint brelard in the Channel Islands, you can see the change take place. Today, the Channel Islands are some 35 kilometers off the coast of France. But when the ice sheets locked up the world's water, the sea dried up, becoming grassland across which giant herbivores roamed. Somehow the great animals were stampeded by the hunters and driven to their deaths over the cliff edge. as well as a mass of fossilized bones at the bottom of the cliff, like this skull of a woolly rhinoceros, there were thousands of simple stone tools of the type made by the early Homo people for butchery. From other remains, around 200,000 years later, there are both more advanced tools and 13 teeth, quite specifically Neanderthal teeth. The peoples who repeatedly used the cliffs had changed in response to the ice, evolving into the Neanderthal. Neanderthals are to many people a metaphor for brutishness, the archetypal caveman. But they probably lived in all sorts of places. Caves are just very good at preserving remains. Caves such as this one in Yugoslavia with its trove of Neanderthal skulls. One has a deep wound that has healed. What that must mean is that someone who was incapacitated for a long time, unconscious, even brain damaged, was cared for, fed, nursed by brutal cavemen. Neanderthal brains were about the same size as ours, or even larger. Not only did they bury their dead, but they did it with some ceremony. Animal skulls have been found carefully arranged around their graves, and fossilized pollen suggests that there were flowers there too.
All of this implies some concept of an afterlife, or at least a sense of loss. A need to readjust through ritual, exactly as we do in different ways today. For a hundred thousand years, the Neanderthals were the only humans in Europe. And then something happened. They were sophisticated, caring, certainly adapted to the geography and the climate. But they vanished. 35,000 years ago, one human face of Europe was replaced by another. Ours, physically identical to us in every respect, these were our true ancestors. Where did we come from? Another great ice age cycle had begun, and once more the plains of Africa had dried out. While the Neanderthals were evolving in Europe, our direct ancestors had been evolving in Africa. All the races of humans on the earth today are descended from these African ancestors. A second great human migration out of Africa began. And 2,000 years after our forebears reached Europe, the last pockets of Neanderthals were wiped out. No intermediate fossils between Neanderthals and ourselves have ever been found. It seems that we simply took their place, violently maybe, or by simply outcompeting them with the aid of a more complex social structure and more advanced toolkit. We may not have had the Neanderthal strength, but we were better with our hands. Our toolkit was based around long flint blades, struck from a carefully prepared core. These blades could be worked by precise new techniques to create spear and arrowheads. The same flint blades form the basis of a wide range of other tools. We discovered an entirely new concept, glue, and another, string, with a mixture of plant resins and beeswax Secured with animal sinews, we could attach flint to a wooden shaft to make stone-tipped spears and arrows. And that wasn't all. We had shoes and well-made clothes. We even had whistles. Made from the toe bones of deer. Perhaps for coordinating the hunt. Eighteen thousand years ago, our ancestors invented the bow and arrow, as well as producing high-speed spear throwers capable of felling a deer in full flight. never seemed to rest. With flint blades we made points, scrapers and carving tools. And with them we made Europe's very first works of art, true-to-life etchings of animals. And sculptures, such as these swimming deer, with all life's proper dimensions and realism down to the folds of skin around their eyes. 23,000 years ago, a human, in Europe, sat down and carved this tiny, exquisite head.
Heavily pregnant figures like these have been found right across Europe, from France to the Soviet Union. The end of the Neanderthals and our arrival took place in one of Europe's warm periods. Then, 20,000 years ago, the ice started to move again. Another ice age had begun. The Neanderthals had evolved physically to withstand the cold. But would modern man be able to cope with the same bitter conditions? Unlike their thick-coated companions, they were not biologically adapted to the cold. They had to use their wits. Right up at the very edge of the ice, where there were no trees to build shelters, they built them instead out of the animals they killed. 15,000 years ago, huts made of the bones of mammoths. They were built by people on the move, and they were temporary. When in use, they would have had skins drawn tightly over the frame. Whole encampments were made this way. One site in modern Czechoslovakia had used the remains of 900 mammoths. Astounding testimonies to human inventiveness. The peak of the cold corresponds to a peak of creativity. It was now that people began to paint, and to paint the principal objects of their desire, their prey, like the bison. But the paintings were no clumsy efforts. In Altamira, in northern Spain, on the ceiling of a cave, there are paintings that are 14,000 years old, which are surely masterpieces. The very contours of the rock have been used to recreate the hunched power of a bison. These ceilings were discovered in 1879 by a nine-year-old girl. Her father, an archaeologist working in the cave, was so engrossed by the debris on the floor that he never thought to look up. The paintings match their subjects so perfectly that at first, other archaeologists refused to believe that they were what they were. They said they must be fakes. Why they were painted, no one can know. Maybe the cold had driven the great herds of bison away. Perhaps the painters were trying to persuade the gods to bring them back. In the cave at Altamira, along with a herd of 26 painted bison, the artists left marks on the ceiling where they'd run their fingers along the muddy rock. Marks which remain to this day. It's possible to work out the exact technique of the prehistoric artists. First, they used a stone to scratch out the animal's shape. And then over that made a charcoal outline. Then the paint. Rocks were ground up and mixed with water or a little fat and were applied by finger. Black colour came from rocks containing manganese and red and yellow from different kinds of ochre coloured by iron oxide.
If Altamira's vision of bison is the prehistoric Sistine Chapel of Spain, France has Lascaux, 750 kilometers away. The same masterful execution, with a larger assortment of subjects. Perhaps there was a school of painters, a guild, even a priesthood, who decorated caves throughout the region. But what are they for? Why are they so often in places so hard to reach and so dark? Maybe they're illustrations for hunting lessons or for stories. Maybe they were done for pleasure or decoration or all of these. There's no reason why they couldn't have had their own Rembrandt, or for that matter, poets, musicians, or philosophers. There's no reason why they couldn't have had a rich culture, and by the evidence of their painting, they probably did. It's just that the paintings are the only messages to make it from their age to ours. And until somebody invents time travel, we'll simply never know. the new Europeans, the reward for surviving an ice age was a much improved continent. The world emerged from the melting ice cap as if from a cocoon, newly shaped, fresh, well watered, vibrant. beginning of an era of warmth that, with minor fluctuations, was to last until today. It was the beginning of our Europe. Our mountain ranges are the result of larger and more solid mountains being carved by ice and where they poked above the ice, shattered by frost and becoming the jagged peaks of today. The shape of our landscape is the cumulative result of many ice ages working on a basic landmass. Each one taking up with the last left off, cutting deeper valleys, carving steeper mountains, scouring the rocks, leaving marks. When water is frozen and yet flowing, however slowly, the power is massive. It can grasp a mountain and flatten it, pick up its debris and dump it in incongruous piles, hundreds of kilometers away. And then, when the ice goes, there's a brand new topography waiting for life. Up to now, there had been one basic human way of making a living. Restless, often nomadic, hunting and gathering following their prey. Ever since our ancestors arrived in Europe, their life had been mainly a matter of making the best of unhappy conditions. But where they found themselves now was in a relatively gentle land that seemed to be made for them. People could settle permanently beside lakes and never exhaust the food supply.
From all over Europe comes evidence of humans settling down in this garden of Eden. And as always, inventing new ways of exploiting it. One group of people in Denmark developed a highly sophisticated eel fishing technology with canoes, night lighting, and special forked spears for gripping the slippery prey. These people were so well surrounded by resources that they probably didn't have to work for more than 20 hours a week and had a lot of time for art, music, storytelling. Fish was the perpetual resource. So important that in at least one settlement, at Lepenske Vir on the Danube, the people carved fish for gods. These people left behind remains of birds, fish, game, and in some places, stacks of shells. The shells in shell middens, found in prehistoric sites all over Europe, still lie where they were thrown after the flesh was plucked out of them. Maybe swallowed raw, or maybe put into a stew, boiled with hot stones. This midden in Portugal, though nearly hidden by the trees on it, is enormous and must have taken hundreds of years to accumulate. It represents a society so settled that generations of people were buried in the great shell pile that they themselves had helped create. All through the new, warm Europe, such displays of permanence herald the end of the hunting and gathering lifestyle. For thousands of years, in competition with many other animals, humans had been eating seeds, collected from as many as 150 different species. But there wasn't much nourishment here for something the size of a human. And then, in what is now Iraq, there was an amazing stroke of good fortune. Two wild grasses had hybridized, and the grains they produced were much fatter than before. It was wheat. Collecting enough food suddenly became much easier. The more so because the fat seeds tended to fall near their parent plants and to create large clusters. And that may have suggested the revolutionary idea of planting the seeds for themselves. Over 10,000 years ago, long before Europe had either the plants or the knowledge, Near Eastern farmers were planting, tending, and harvesting their crops. The addition of agriculture to the human range of skills has been called our greatest revolution. The collected heads of wheat had to be processed. First, the seeds had to be freed from their spiky glooms. It's thought by singeing. Then, after winnowing to remove the husk, the loose grain could be laboriously ground into flour. Hunter-gathering had needed exceptionally game-rich areas for any sort of permanent base. Most people were continually on the move, following their prey. Farming meant that the whole continent, the flatter parts at least, 
was open to human settlement. Compared to the varied diet of the roaming hunter-gatherers, the new one seems pretty dull. Flour could be made into gruel, or mixed with a little water and fat, kneaded into unleavened cakes. Given taste, perhaps, by honey. But there was meat, too. Because soon after people began controlling the plant life around them, they took the next logical step and domesticated animals. Starting with the dog as a hunting assistant, prehistoric people developed from the idea of growing your own seeds to the concept of raising your own prey. And they tamed a succession of now familiar species. Sheep, goats, pigs, cats and cattle, and about a dozen others. The precursors of today's docile domestic animals were often formidable beasts. The ancestral type of sheep, for instance, were tough, aggressive and extremely athletic. Exactly how our ancestors managed to tame them and produce today's woolly brain creatures is a mystery, but it must rank high in the list of human achievements. In more recent times, our achievements have been pathetic. The Romans tamed the rabbit, and we, the hamster, guinea pig, and laboratory rat. When agriculture finally reached Europe, the Ice Age again made a crucial contribution. As the ice sheet retreated, it left in its wake vast amounts of finely ground debris, the powdered remnants of the mountains that had flattened. The very finest, known as Lurse, was picked up by wind and water and deposited again in thick layers. In swathes that followed the prevailing winds across the continent. And Lurse, left by the ice, made very good farmland, fertile and easy to work. The first European farmers spread along the bands of Lurse, wherever they led. Of course, the rest of nature hadn't been waiting for agriculture to find its way to Europe. Often, forests had already grown up on the fertile Lurse. Thousand years ago, the European paradise suffered its first great wave of deforestation. Then later, cattle came. Not for their beef so much as for their living muscle, pulling wooden plows. This broke up the former forest soil and aerated it and brought new nutrients to the surface for new crops. Agriculture, while bringing stability, brought other changes too. Farmers could build permanent houses, sheltering the same family for generations. This is Lac de Chalin in France, the site of houses 
five and a half thousand years old, which archaeologists have been able to reconstruct. From the site, they've excavated clay pots, beakers, cheese molds full of holes. There are even cores of chewed crab apples and singed ears of corn. For all the security that agriculture conferred, it also meant the end of the 20-hour working week. The labour was long and the ties to the land were firm. For some, it was miserable. These bones tell the story of a gruelling, brutish life. She was a young woman, somewhere between 18 and 24. Her toes are arthritic, with large masses of bone growth where none should be, probably caused by repeated and excessive pressure. The knees are arthritic too. In life, these deformed and callous joints must have caused the woman unbearable pain. The vertebrae from her lower back are crushed and bent. For most of this young woman's life, such as it was, it seems she did practically nothing but grind corn into flour. She could have spent as much as five hours a day on her knees at the grindstone. But why did they bother? Once the population began to rise, there wasn't enough game to return to hunter-gathering, so it was agriculture or starvation. As the Bible says, we were indeed cursed to eat bread in the sweat of our faces. Agriculture may have brought a heightened awareness of certain aspects of nature. Astronomy, for example. It seems to have been a factor in the orientation of houses. Some of them seem to have been aligned with the summer solstice. An effect of farming, perhaps, was an increased sensitivity to the seasons. So far had people progressed from temporary huts that they had permanent buildings for the dead, long barrows. And some of them were aligned towards the winter solstice, summer for the living, winter for the dead. And inside, designs, circles, interpreted by some as expressions of the unbroken, unending cycle of life and death. This tomb, Newgrange in Southern Ireland, was built over 5,000 years ago. When it was built, and it was built meticulously, these gigantic European tombs were the most impressive monuments in the world. Even the pyramids wouldn't be started for more than a thousand years. The huge stone monuments, megaliths, often dominate the surrounding countryside. Focal points for the farming community, perhaps a mark of ownership and permanence. Another monumental fashion spread from either northern France or the Iberian Peninsula. Huge standing stones, such as these in Portugal.
Individual stones became circles. From Portugal to Scotland. Five thousand years ago, all over Europe from the scrublands of Portugal to the bleak islands of Scotland, as far east as Palestine and at many points in between, people were building stone circles, megaliths, without any apparent direct communication between one community and another. Why? Was it simply a stage in human development that everyone was going through at the same time? Was there communication? And was this a sort of world religion? The bones and tools of our early ancestors are open to analysis and interpretation, but their thoughts and beliefs are not. By now, agriculture had reached a peak of success. The population had grown. Farmland was hard to find. And for the first time in European history, people built fortresses to defend it. The tools they used to build them and the weapons they used for defense were not made of stone. So far, Europe and its various peoples had been molded and driven by ice. Now, they turned to fire. 6,500 years ago, the age of metals had begun. Starting with copper, Europeans began their exploration of the geological resources the continent had to offer. a process upon which all our subsequent history would be built. European civilization